Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I am not Faye Jensen. I am John Tucker, the Assistant Director of the South Carolina Historical Society. And I want to welcome you to our fourth in a series of lectures. And tonight, the subject is golf. And we have our local expert who's never played a round of golf. <laughs> but she knows the history, which is important. Dr. Faye Jensen received her PhD from Emory. We won't hold that against her. And she was also a, on staff at the Jimmy Carter Library as an archivist, I believe, for about 10 years. And she has taught at several locations, including the University of Alabama, the Citadel, uh, Portugal, and other locations. She has also contributed to Modern First Ladies, which was published in 1995, and Making a New South, published in 2007. And she's authored several articles for the Carillon. So join me in welcoming my boss, who it's a pleasure to work for, <laughs> Dr. Faye Jensen. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, we were joking about this earlier, and I said uh, I could introduce myself, but that might be a bit awkward. Um, I have never played a round of golf. That's my first disclaimer when I give this talk. Now, um, I did take it, though, for PE, for a PE credit as an undergraduate at the University of Georgia, and I'm not going to share with you how many years ago that was. Um, but I, I did. I, I took it once. Um, however, I have a lot of golfers in my household. And we're going to talk about golf in South Carolina because when we were discussing all the firsts, of course, golf is, is one of the big firsts in South Carolina's history. And when we make that claim, it's usually related to the fact that we know in Charleston there was a golf membership club established in 1786. And so that's what usually you see, South Carolina first in golf, and then it's followed by that year, 1786. Now, this advertisement in the Charleston City Gazette um, was actually uh, from 1795 and it announces the anniversary of the club. It notes that the members will meet at the clubhouse on Harleston Green. There was an even earlier announcement uh, that actually dates from 1788 that invited the members to meet at John Williams Coffee Shop on East Bay Street after they played their round of golf. And uh, that announcement stated that the club began in 1786. So that's where we get that date from. Now, in 1980, Charles Price, who is a well-known golf historian, and um, George Rogers, Jr., who a lot of you will know is sort of the authority on social life in the low country um, in colonial times, wrote this little book, um, Carolina Low Country, Birthplace of American Golf, 1786. It's a great little book, hard to get, but, but it's, it's very good. Very good. And in this book, um, they have this notation from a 1788 almanac. And if you look uh, to your left at the very top of the page, you'll see that it gives the off notes the officers of the club and again states that that club was, was formed in 1786. Price and Rogers also point out, um, just as we saw in the previous ad from the Gazette, that uh, the sport was played at Harleston's Green. But we know there were a lot of greens in Charleston at that time. As a matter of fact, there were Savage's Green, there were other greens. And so it was probably played on a number of greens. We just have the evidence that, it was, uh, that they played frequently on Harleston's Green. Now this map um, is of Charleston, and it is actually, um, it was drawn after Harleston's Green disappeared. 
but it does show where Har Harleston Green was uh, probably located. It was the area just south of Calhoun Street, which at that time was called Boundary Street. And today, a lot of the marsh has been filled in, so it, Charles, the peninsula looks a lot different than it did back then. Uh, but Harleston's Green, as I said, was south of Boundary and then just east of Rutledge. Now, as those of you who know a lot about golf um, will probably remember, the physical aspects of the 18th century game were much different than the one we know today. Uh, they played on these greens, which were basically city parks. And uh, that's where we get the term greens fee, because they had to pay the city in, or in order to be able to pay, play there. There were no tees, there were no defined numbers of holes, and there were no putting surfaces. It was nothing like these nice manicured golf courses that we have now. Uh, the ball was made of leather, it was hand-stitched together, and then it was filled with boiled feathers, which apparently when they dried gave the ball a lot of resilience. It was called a feathery because of that. Uh, the clubs, of course, were mostly wooden, and they were spoon-shaped, so they're frequently called spoons. Now, one of the players, or a servant, would be designated as the finder. That meant that he had to go out and look for the holes, and then he would stand there and point at them. Now, these are town parks, these greens. So people are using them for all kinds of activities. Um, there are kids playing on them. There are couples strolling on them. There are people having picnics on them. So in addition to finding the hole, the finder's duty also included warning all the non-golfers that the golfers were coming and swinging clubs with leather balls. And so he did this by saying, you are forewarned, which of course was shortened to four. Um, now, because I don't play, I wanted to explain to you what a round of golf was like in 1786. And I decided, if you will indulge me, the best way to do that is to read from Charles Price, because he is a, a very well-known golf historian, and he can explain this better. And this is what he says. Let us presume, by way of showing how the system operated, that a match is taking place between two of the members, Mr. Penman and Mr. Gardner. On the first hole, Mr. Penman hits the shorter first shot. He will therefore be the first to play the second shot. In doing so, he would play what they called the odd, one shot more than his opponent. Then, when Mr. Gardner in his turn plays his second shot, he will be playing the like, the same numbers of stroke as his opponent's. If his shot fails to go as far as Mr. Penman's, it will again be Mr. Gardner's turn to play, and this time it will be he who is playing the odd. Now, if he still fails to catch up to Mr. Penman, it will still be his turn, and this time he will be playing the two more. If he should fluff this one, failing still again to pass Mr. Penman, his next shot will be the three more. Mr. Penman, in his turn, will be playing one off three. And so the system progressed. At every point at which Mr. Penman and Mr. Gardner have played an equal number of strokes, they would describe their position as like as we lie. Eventually, as in matches today, the person who has more holes up on his opponent than remain to be played was declared the winner. So that's the way they played a round of golf. Now, 
Thanks to George Rogers, who's a wonderful historian, we know a good bit about these early players in Charleston. These are the names of the first known officers of the South Carolina Golf Club. The vice president, Edward Penman, and secretary treasurer, James Garner, were Scottish merchants. Now, I'm going to get back to the Scottish merchants in a minute, but we need to take just a few minutes um, to speak about the president, the first known president of the South Carolina Golf Club, Dr. Henry Purcell. You see his portrait um, on this slide, and many of you probably know Dr. George Williams. He was a familiar face at the Historical Society for several years, and um, he did a good deal of research on St. Michael's Church. He left us a wonderful little book called The Early Ministers of St. Michael's. So um, thanks to him, we know a good bit about Dr. Henry Purcell. We know that uh, Dr. Purcell came from England with a good bit of money. He purchased a plantation when he got to Charleston in Craven County. He purchased a tract of land in St. Andrew's Parish and he had a townhouse at the corner of Pitt and Bull Street. We know that he was chaplain to Patriot Forces during the Revolution. After the war, he served St. Michael's Congregation, and he was very well known throughout the National Episcopal Church. He was awarded the degree of Doctor of Divinity from um, the College of New Jersey, or what was then the College of New Jersey, in 1786. As George Williams says, Dr. Purcell was, and I'm quoting here, perhaps the most colorful priest that the 18th century church provided in America. Purcell was a man about town. He enjoyed society. He was a member of the Society of Cincinnati and the Masons. He was a sportsman who liked hunting and golf and swimming. And George Williams says Purcell was a judge of fine women and fine property who married for the second time at 52 and acquired thereby an ancestral plantation. Uh, George Williams also tells a story about Dr. Purcell that has been handed down to become a legend at St. Michael's that uh, apparently there was a funeral and St. and uh, Dr. Purcell was the officiating minister, and they had all gathered at the burial ground. The mourners were there, Dr. Purcell was there, but the horse-drawn hearse and the coffin had not arrived. So Dr. Purcell begins pacing up and down, very agitated, checking his watch, very, very upset, and, and telling people that he has a very important appointment to keep. So finally he gets so agitated, he says, listen, if the hearse doesn't show up in, in a quarter of an hour, that's the way he put it, I just, I have to leave for this appointment. So 15 minutes goes by to the amazement of the mourners who had assembled to bury their relative and dear friend, after 15 minutes, Dr. Purcell rips off his vestments, underneath which there is a full attire of hunting clothes, jumps on his steed, and gallops away. Apparently, his most important appointment was a hunt that he could not miss. Um, so we know we have an avid sportsman here. Um, as our first president. Dr. Purcell was also an accomplished musician. Um, he and Bishop Robert Smith of St. Philip's compiled a hymnal that was used for about 20 years. Uh, we have a reproduction of that. It was um, printed in 1950. It's part of our collection at the Historical Society. Purcell died in 1802. And we have uh, estate records of, of his, um, what he left. And uh, apparently he, he enjoyed other things besides sports because the estate records show that in the cellar of his townhouse there were 87 dozen, 87 dozen bottles of sherry 
Madeira, Burgundy, Port, Champagne, and Brandy. As Dr. Williams noted, he knew how, he knew how to live well. Um, now, getting back to the golf club. As I said, Dr. Purcell was an exception. Uh, George Rogers tracked down every member of the golf club that he could find. He went through city directories, he went through almanacs that listed the officers, and he did meticulous research on these men, and by far away, the majority were Scottish, which goes to figure, and that they were merchants. So the majority of them, so Purcell was, was really in the minority because he was an Englishman. Now, Rogers' thorough investigation of the members' estate records revealed that at least two of them bequeathed golf sticks, as some of them called the clubs, and balls to their heirs. You can see here that Archibald Johnston and William White both left uh, their equipment to someone. And that tells us that this was, these were prized possessions to these men, the, the fact that they would bother to list them um, in their wills. Rogers' research also proved um, that the club played on Harleston Green through 1799. It's funny, but right at the end of the century, Rogers says he can't find anything more in the Charleston papers about the club. Uh, it's, it's also interesting that um, there was a similar cl golf club established a little bit later in Savannah, and he did find that they were continuing to announce their um, meetings and their play in um, the Savannah paper up to about 1810. But after 1800, he can't find anything about the South Carolina Golf Club. According to Rogers, there was a reason for this. He thinks the sport dwindled. Um, it may not have died out completely, but it lost a lot of popularity in Charleston right about the turn of the century. And he suggests that the reason for that was the departure of a lot of these Scottish merchants. They had been loyalist during the Revolution, so they weren't real popular. So a lot of them left because of that. In addition, when we get to 1808, Jefferson's embargo forbade trade with every foreign port. So you see a number of merchants uh, in, the, in the new country, either leaving or changing jobs, but a lot of, a lot of these people from Scotland simply went back home when Jefferson um, uh, put, uh, installed his embargo in 1808. Now Rogers goes on to speculate there was another reason that the sport um, lost popularity, and he says that's because it was never a popular sport with the planter elite. And as we get into the antebellum era, we see a surge in other sports, hunting, riding, horse racing is really big. Um, and those were the sports of the planter elite. That golf was a merchant sport. And in a very stratified society, merchants were considered middle class. So, according to Rogers, that would be the, the, the second reason that you would have um, just, you know, sort of a lull in the activity in, uh, in golf in the low country. So, usually, getting back to my first point, when we talk about South Carolina first in golf, people are referring to that first golf club, golf, golf membership club um, on Harleston Green. In actuality, there was a first before that first. So that's the second first, and there was a first first. Now, when Rogers and Price were researching for this book, for their little book on golf in the low country, um, they noted in a footnote that there were claims in a Charleston family that there had been a transatlantic shipment of golf clubs. That predated the, the, the golf club um, formation, but they couldn't verify it. Well, I'm so sad that George Rogers is not with us anymore because we have verified it. It's so exciting. We now know that the first transatlantic shipment of golf clubs 
did indeed arrive in Charleston. The clubs were sent from Leith, Scotland to a Charlestonian by the name of David Days. Now Days was from Leith and he immigrated to Charleston in 1738. Now just to keep everything in context for you, um, because this is a lecture series, 1738 was about the same time that Eliza Lucas Pinckney arrived. So Days and, David Days and Eliza Lucas Pinckney come to Charleston um, probably the same year. Now Days, Scottish, founded a very successful mercantile business. Those of you who know about the history of golf know that Leith claims to be the place where the game originated. As a matter of fact, the early records note that the town council of Leith banned golf, along with football, in 1457. Yes, I said 1457. Again, to keep things in context, that's 35 years before Columbus. Um, they banned it because King James II said that the playing of golf and football was distracting his archers. So, and that's in their town records in Leith. Um, so the, these two photographs are photographs of current Leith. And um, if you look to the one on the right, you'll see what is supposed to be the remainder of what was Leith Links, or the first golf links in Leith. Um, Leith is now, if, if some of you have been, it's a suburb of Edinburgh in Scotland um, on the coast. Now, the Leith Society of Golfers still exists today. They derive the name of the club from the Leith Code, which composes, again, as many of you are, who are golfers know, um, the first written rules of golf. According to the Society's website, the Leith Code was written in 1744 for a competition among the members of the Company of Gentlemen Golfers of Leith, which later morphed into the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers. Now, the Leith Code, of course, was later adopted by the Society of St. Andrews Golfers, and they morphed into the modern Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews. So the Leith Code has evolved into what we know of as the 34 Rules of Golf. So this game is really important in Leith. It's kind of like defines them. And this is the town where David Days is from. So it's really not surprising that he would want to bring the game to his new home in Charleston. Now, you may have read about this. There was an article in the Post and Courier um, this past spring, but a descendant of David Day's, Gant Feline, uh, has obtained a copy of the original customs ledger that verifies 432 balls and 96 clubs were shipped aboard a boat called the Magdalene from Leith on the 12th of May, 17. 43. That's a year before the Leith Codes were even written. This is a copy of the original manifest, or, or a, a list of the ship's exports. Uh, the copy was obtained from the National Archives of Scotland. At the top, you can see it says outwards. Can you all read it? Can you see it? Okay, and uh, it has the date, 1743, the 12th of May, and uh, the first sentence reads, in the Magdalen, William Carse made for South Carolina. Now, of course, Carse would have been the shipmaster. Now, where the gold arrow is, I hope that you can see it. We'll, we'll give this document a little bit of credit because it's over 260 years old. Um, but where, where the gold arrow is, is the name David Days. And the green arrow points, unfortunately, it's right on the fold of the manifest, but there's an entry there that says, 
two boxes of eight dozen golf clubs, three gross golf balls. Interesting, again, it says that the balls and the clubs were shipped to Days along with B British made sailcloth and several bushes of Scots salt. <laughs> so this was just one of his importations, one of the things he was receiving as a Charleston merchant. But it's pretty significant because this manifest clearly indicates that Charlestonians were enjoying the game of golf some 40 years before we can confirm the existence of the golf club that was formed around Harleston Green and a full generation before the revolution. So as far as first goes, this, this was pretty significant. Now, I'm going to talk about another South Carolina golf first, but to get there, we've got to move into the, 20, the early 20th century. Um, so we've got to trace the evolution of the game. As I mentioned, there was a lull in the sport, um, early 1800s. But by the late 1800s, it, it didn't last long because move forward a little bit, um, we hit the age of uh, railroad empires, and we get to the Industrial Revolution, and all of a sudden, golf becomes very popular again. Um, it's the day of electricity and telephones, and a lot of wealth happens because of the Industrial Re Revolution. Wealthy Americans have leisure time, and they have money. And that's so important for recreation. Andrew Carnegie, a native of Scotland, obviously loved the game of golf. Um, he was a founder of the St. Andrew's Golf Club, uh, and I think it's very interesting that he wrote, uh, I believe it was in 1911, he wrote that uh, the St. Andrew's Golf Club was the first golf club founded in America. So much for what he knew. Uh, and then uh, the, the um, course on the bottom right of that slide is of the private course that was uh, at uh, John Rockefeller's home, which overlooked the Hudson River. So we have wealthy Americans enjoying the game, and that's going to spread to other people. Uh, it becomes very, very popular. Nothing ever changes. I love history. It just repeats itself. So these wealthy northerners frequently want to play the game more than their two months of summer, right? So what are they going to do? You know, they're going to take the train to South Carolina so they can play golf. And it, it's just then as now. We have this paradise, and we're going to, make, we're going to um, construct some golf courses on it. Now, there are golf courses just like today being built for two different kinds of clientele. We have those being built for locals, and we have those being built as resorts for visitors. Now, for the sake of continuity, let's look, let's go back away from our northern industrialists and look at the local clubs, um, because that South Carolina golf club that used to play at Harleston Green, I don't think ever really died away. I think these men gave their clubs to their sons. I think their sons kept hitting those balls. Now, I agree with Rogers. They may not have posted their notices in the newspaper. You may not really see any evidence of them, but I don't believe it fully died out because in the late 1800s, we have Charlestonians playing golf at a place called the Chikora Golf Club. Now, this was located on the west bank of the Cooper River in what was now North Charleston. We know they played there late 1800s because when the city sold that property in 1901, these same golfers found or established the Charleston Country Club and they bought Belvedere Plantation 
which was actually closer into town, uh, still on the, on the Cooper River, Belvedere was just north of where Magnolia Cemetery is. And they laid out a nine-hole golf course. Uh, this is Belvedere Plantation. This nine-hole golf course uh, that became the Charleston Country Club was Charleston's first modern golf course. It was private. It opened in 1901 with a membership of 300, which for 1901 I think is pretty good. Uh, there's an article in the News and Courier that says, with the Chikora Golf Club grounds turned over to the government, it became necessary to find a new abiding place for the multitude of golf enthusiasts who had sprung up in Charleston since the opening of Chikora Links. The situation is an ideal one for a country club, and the members may consider themselves lucky. So they moved there in 1901. Ten years later, 1913, they expanded to an 18-hole golf course. Right after they did that, Belvedere was sold to Standard Oil. The club then picked up and moved to a part of land uh, that was uh, on McLeod Plantation along Wapu Creek on James Island. Golf course architect Seth Rayner was chosen to design a 236 acre course that would become known locally as Wapu Links but also, as we know it now, the Country Club of Charleston. Uh, as some of you know, their new clubhouse was built on the site of Battery Means, a Civil War fortification that overlooked Charleston Harbor. And this new Country Club golf course opened in 1925. Now, another early course opened for locals was in the upcountry. Not all of South Carolina golf happened here. 1910, the Country Club of Spartanburg opened their course. Why Spartanburg? It was the Lowell of the South. Spartanburg had, a, this, was, this was the heyday of textile mills. Once again, you have money and leisure time. So you have this, this lovely golf course. Uh, the original nine hole course uh, featured sand greens which were an innovation at the time. And the club hired a Mr. Newman from England as their golf professional. In the 1920s, uh, they had their course redesigned by Donald Ross, well known uh, as the architect of Pinehurst, North Carolina. He was born in Scotland in 1872, and I think he designed something like four, over 400 courses in his lifetime. He's frequently cited as one of the, or as the finest golf architect of the early 20th century. Now, not to be left out, we've got a golf club up in Spartanburg. We have one down in Charleston. Heavens knows, we have to have one in Columbia. Uh, Columbia's Forest Lake Club constructed a course in 1923. Again, there were a number of cotton mills in Columbia. It was the seat of government. It just seemed a perfect place. Um, you know, these people have to get away from, from all the stress, so they have to go play golf. Um, <clears throat> The designer in Columbia was Maurice McCarthy, senior of New York. McCarthy also, a, uh, he was a well-known uh, golfer who designed several other courses, including the Knickerbocker Country Club of New Jersey and the Hershey Country Club in Pennsylvania. So that's sort of where our courses for the locals are in the early um, 20th century. I have to tell you, I was really stunned when I turned and started looking at the courses built as resorts, because these are, these are some really old courses. In the 1880s, as I said, South Carolina attracted a lot of tourists. Um, many came for recreation, a lot of people came for health benefits, and of course they came just for relief from the harsh north, northern winters. Uh, and grand hotels sprung up in, in the state to accommodate these visitors. 
During this time, W.F. and George Wagner opened a place called Pine Forest Inn in Somerville. In the late 19th century, Somerville promoted itself as a health resort for pulmonary patients. The folks there claimed that the pine-laden atmosphere was an excellent place if you suffered from asthma or tuberculosis. So the Wagners, when they opened Pine Forest Inn, provided a number of activities for their guests. They included tennis and hunting and riding. And in 1891, they built a 130-acre golf course that, according to their brochure, I like this, it was designed by, this is a quote, a professional from the north who has played on the celebrated links of St. Andrews. So that qualified him. Um, anyway, they, uh, they were very proud of their golf course at Pine Forest Inn. And uh, one of their brochures, this brochure dates from 1910, and it uh, has a description of each hole in its bogey, which is interesting, not its par, but its bogey. Uh, and uh, they also, if you look at this, you can tell that they may have started with only nine holes, but by 1910, Pine Forest had 18 holes. Now, around the same time that we were um, seeing, seeing the uh, resort course being built in Somerville, uh, the owners of the Kirkwood Hotel in Camden decided to add a small course. Camden was served by three railroads, and it was very popular among northern visitors. The Kirkwood Hotel just happened to be strategically located on the rail line. In 1922, they improved their course and hired Walter Travis, who was a three-time amateur champion, to design what was known as Kirkwood Lynx. Now, the course is still there, and Dave and I drove by recently, and, and we got a few peeks at it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, it's now the Camden Country Club. And what's really neat is if, if you're ever, ever privileged enough to get to play there, stop and look because Railroad tracks still run between the 12th and the 13th hole at the Camden Country Club. So it's kind of neat, just take you back in history a little bit. Another resort course that was built by Northerners, for Northerners, uh, was at Yeamans Hall, or is at Yeamans Hall. In 1925, a group of well-to-do gentlemen in New York decided to establish a winter resort on the site of John Yeaman's plantation uh, near Goose Creek. Now, you remember I said Seth Rayner was the architect of the Charleston Country Club course. Well, because he was there and because he was so well-known, um, the designers of Yeaman Hall asked him if he would design, the, uh, the de design their course as well. Uh, local boy, Charlton Desisor, has written a book called The Cottages and Architects of Yeamans Hall. And in that book, uh, Charlton reflects on Rayner's Olmsted-like philosophy. I'm sure you all know that Frederick Law Olmsted designed Central Park in New York and is the father of what's known as the um, urban forestry movement. Anyway, um, Rayner followed Olmsted's suggestion that the environment should dictate his design. And as evidence of this, uh, Charlton quotes from a letter that Rayner wrote to the club's organizers in 1923. He said, I was so charmed with the beauty of the landscape, views both distant and near, the running springs, magnificent trees, especially the views combining meadow and upland with the river circling through, that I needed to look at the whole thing from a distance. There is no doubt in my mind about your being able to build a magnificent golf course amid such surroundings. The nature of the ground with the gently rolling contours and fine drainage certainly invites the architect with irresistible force to create something unique. 
I was struck by that quote because I thought, oh my, doesn't this apply to so many golf courses in the low country? Um, if you think about those at Kiowa um, and, and all the other places, uh, I think Rayner's vision uh, continued through, throughout many, many courses. It's kind of sad, Rayner was 51 when he died and the Yemen's Hall course is one of the last that he designed. Uh, another little treasure we have at the Historical Society uh, is this design of, of the Yemen's Hall's course. You can see, uh, this is just a section of our, um, the total drawing, and uh, this is, has the 11th, 15th, 16th, and 17th holes. Again, those of you who play um, will know that Yemen's Hall is consistently ranked among the top 50 courses in the country and uh, golf course analysts and players both just absolutely love it. So it's supposed to be a really, really neat place to play. Now, the last resort courses uh, that I'm going to talk about were both uh, constructed in Aiken. So we're going to Aiken now. Like Camden, Aiken was a popular winter resort for a lot of northern families in the late 1800s. As a matter of fact, it was so popular that many of them built, I'm gonna use my hands here, cottages there. Um, they, they were obviously big, beautiful, lovely homes, but they called them cottages. Uh, and once there, they looked for ways to amuse themselves. Well, among those were the Hitchcocks of Long Island. Just as now, uh, a lot of the recreational activities in Aiken centered around equestrian um, recreation. But golf was also a favorite. In 1892, Thomas Hitchcock laid out four holes for golf and the Palmetto Golf Club was born. In 1895, that course was expanded to 18 holes. And that's really early for an 18-hole golf course. As a matter of fact, the Palmetto Golf Club claims to be the oldest continually operated 18-hole, did you get all those conditions? <laughs> oldest continually operated 18-hole golf course in the southeast. So that's the Palmetto Golf Club. Now this map of Aiken shows how you got to the Palmetto Golf Club um, and you can see that to the opposite, on the opposite side of the road is the racetrack and what's really interesting to me about this is that to get to the golf club or the racetrack, can you see the name of the road you had to travel on? You had to go down Whiskey Road. That had to be intentional. They just had, that's just too cute. So, this gets us to the last of South Carolina's firsts. It happened in Aiken. Now, as I said, a lot of families, uh, northern families built cottages. So they were, you know, fairly uh, permanent residents. So they had their Palmetto Golf Club. Well, there were people who came to Aiken who didn't own cottages and they would have been staying in, in one of the, the um, resort hotels. The Highland Park Hotel was just beautiful um, and it accommodated winter guests in Aiken. Now sometime, we're not sure exactly when, but sometime in the late 1890s or early 1900s, the hotel installed a small four hole golf course. In 1903, Donald Ross, who I already mentioned, he's of the Pinehurst fame, um, laid out 11 holes for Highland Park. Later, those were expanded by a man named J.R. Inglis to 18. Uh, now, I'm getting most of this information from an article in the state, which had the state um, newspaper from Columbia ran a great, they ran a series on the classic golf courses of South Carolina. Um, and the manager, um, according to the state, 
newspaper. In 1916, the manager of the Highland Park Hotel was a man by the name of A.J. Sweeney. And Mr. Sweeney's wife liked to play golf. About that time, she was reading about America's first woman golf pro, May Queenie Dunn. And this inspired Mrs. Sweeney. She began a local campaign to have women's tees set out on the Highland Park course. And apparently it didn't take much of a campaign. Apparently she had a lot of friends, a lot of women who liked to play golf, and they dominated. Um, they accomplished their goal in March of 1916. The Highland Park Hotel, our golf club, became the first club in America to establish tees for women right here in South Carolina. The club is now the Aiken Golf Club.